Seaman, Chapter 6, Winter Among the Indians October 1804 through April 1805 Autumn came to the Missouri River. Along the banks, leaves changed from green to gold. As the Corps of Discovery made its way upstream, the boats were surrounded by creatures on the move. The sky was filled with flocks of honking, squawking geese and ducks heading south to warmer waters. Large herds of elk and antelope crossed the river, migrating south like the fowl. A hearty wind ruffled Seaman's new winter coat. Chilly nights killed off the mosquitoes, and the river water sparkled in the clear sunshine. In early October, the explorers began to see abandoned villages along the banks of the Missouri. A passing trapper said the Arikara Indians once lived in all these earth lodges, but most of the tribe had been killed by smallpox over the last 25 years. Only a few thousand Arikaras had survived, and they lived on one small island. The trappers also said these Indians sometimes joined with the Sioux to attack the tribes living further up the river. After their unpleasant dealings with the Teton Sioux, the captains wondered if the Arikaras would welcome outsiders. The expedition soon reached the island where the Arikaras lived in four villages. On October 8th, Lewis took some of the men out to meet the Indians. Two days later, the captains held a formal meeting with them, including the usual speech, military display, and gift giving. The captains offered whiskey to the Arikaras, but their chiefs refused. Recalling their meeting with the Teton Sioux Indian chiefs, the captains were both surprised and relieved. The Arikaras gave a warm welcome to their visitors. They escorted the explorers through their villages and proudly showed off their carefully tended vegetable gardens. When the Indians offered some of their harvest, the men rejoiced. For months, they had eaten mostly meat and a little wild fruit. They longed for the corn, squash, and beans that the Indians cultivated. As the explorers toured the Arikara villages, curious Indians trailed after them, staring. The Indians avoided seamen, who was much larger and darker than their village dogs. They pointed at the explorers' clothing and beards, but most of the attention focused on York. None of the Arikaras had ever seen a black man. The adult villagers said York was big medicine. Some of the village children darted between the explorers' legs to peek at this amazing black-skinned man. York found the Indians' curiosity amusing. He pretended not to hear the children approach. Then he would suddenly turn on them and roar. When the children scattered like frightened mice, York laughed until his belly ached. Hello, he hollered, showing his arm muscles and making loud growling noises. Here strides the York beast. York leaped at some children. They yelped, scurrying away to hide behind their lodges. Seaman watched the commotion until he was sure it was a game. Then he barked playfully and ran circles around York. Fee, fi, fo, fum, now the York beast has come. York laughed heartily at his own joke and stamped his foot to make Seaman run faster. Beware! York howled fiercely at small Indian faces peeping around the sides of the lodges. York was fished from the blackest depths of the sea by Master Clark, tamed in the farthest recesses of caves where hairy monsters dwell. York picked up a heavy log and hoisted it above his head to show off his strength. Touch the York beast at your peril. His favorite food is children. York, that's enough ordered Clark, shaking his head and trying not to smile. If you keep it up, the Arikaras will take your joke seriously. We don't want to mislead these kind people. After spending a few pleasant days with the Arikaras, the expedition proceeded on. By the end of October, the explorers were entering the territory of the Mandan Indians. The captains had heard of the Mandan from trappers and traders, and they hoped to set up winter camp near these Indians. On the 24th of October, the Corps met a Mandan hunting party. Some of the explorers could sign or speak a few words of the Mandan language, and the Mandans had learned a few English words from passing traders. After friendly introductions, the chief of the hunting party invited the explorers to his village. Lewis took Seaman and some of the men while Clark and the rest made camp. Lewis and Seaman walked briskly beside the Mandan chief. The Indian pointed out fields where his people grew corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, and tobacco. When the explorers entered the village, they passed about 40 low, circular living huts surrounding a large open space. The most important villagers lived close to the central plaza, which contained a single cedar post and a big lodge. As in the Arikara villages, Indians came out of their huts to watch the newcomers. Little curly-tailed village dogs sniffed at seamen, but he ignored them and stayed close to Lewis. The Mandans were friendly, and they didn't stare and point at the explorers. They were used to all types of visitors because their villages were the central marketplace of the region. Indians from many friendly tribes came to trade, but
bringing livestock, produce, and furs, buffalo hides, blankets, clothing, and firearms, even musical instruments. In late summer, the Mandan villages overflowed with traders from the Crow, Cree, Kiowa, Cheyenne, Assiniboine, and Arapaho tribes. American traders from St. Louis, as well as British and Canadian traders from the Northwest and Hudson's Bay companies also journeyed to the Mandan villages. Back in camp, Lewis described the Mandan village to Clark. The Mandans are peaceful farmers, just like the trappers told us, he said cheerfully. They've been trading with white people for years. If we build our winter camp near here, we'll get along fine with our neighbors. Lewis was in a great mood. He tossed a stick for Seaman to retrieve. When the dog brought it back, Lewis snatched it and hid it behind his back. Seaman lowered his head and front paws and barked, his rear end sticking up and his tail wagging. Lewis laughed and tickled Seaman's whiskers with the stick. Then he rolled the dog onto his back and rubbed his belly. Seaman wiggled away and bounded around the captain, barking happily. The Mandans seemed friendly and helpful, Lewis continued, his enthusiasm bursting through his words. I think they have enough corn for their people and for trading with us during the winter. Lewis tossed the stick again and Seaman pounced on it. Clark was holding a hot stone wrapped in flannel against his sore neck. Sometimes he was troubled by rheumatism, and the condition had been bothering him for the last few days. His mood was somber. He waited while Lewis played with Seaman. Then he asked, how many villages are located nearby, and how many natives live in these villages? The Mandan chief said there are five villages in this area, two Mandan and three Hidatsa. From what I saw and heard, I'd estimate the Indian population at more than 4,000 in all the villages combined. Merriweather, that's more people than live in St. Louis, exclaimed Clark, or in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. How many are warriors? Clark asked pointedly. Lewis thought for a minute, maybe a quarter of the population, I guess. As he worked out the arithmetic and considered the expedition's safety, he frowned. Seaman sat down with the stick in his mouth, watching Lewis. When Lewis spoke, Seaman wagged his tail hopefully, but Lewis ignored the stick and looked at Clark. Seaman stretched himself out with a noisy grunt, dropped the stick on the ground, and laid his chin on his front paws. Almost a thousand warriors are living in the five villages altogether, Lewis concluded. Clark raised his eyebrows and looked at Lewis. The man didn't sound friendly enough, Merriweather, but remember, we have fewer than 30 men in the Corps of Discovery and another 20 men in the group that will return to St. Louis next spring. That's fewer than 50 fighting men compared to a thousand Indian warriors. We must maintain a heavy guard until we're very sure we can trust these people. Of course, Lewis said, nodded thoughtfully. We'll keep to the system we always use when there's a threat. Only one of us at a time will leave our camp. The other will command the soldiers guarding our supplies. On October 29th, the captains held a formal meeting with the Mandans. Lewis gave a speech, the explorers staged a military display, and the Indian chiefs were given small gifts. After the meeting, Lewis had a talk with Black Cat, one of the most powerful Mandan chiefs. Black Cat spoke plainly. When the, Indi when the Indians of the different villages heard of your coming, they all came in from hunting to see. They expected great presents. They were disappointed, and some were dissatisfied. Black Cat did not mean these words as a threat. He was simply explaining his people's feelings to the white captain. Lewis listened quietly and spoke in a calm, reassuring voice. He remembered his recent discussion with Clark. The explorers would be surrounded by thousands of Indians for the winter months. They all needed to stay calm and try to understand each other. The Corps began building their winter quarters on November 2nd, 1804. They chose a spot on the eastern side of the Missouri, near the mouth of the Knife River. The location offered plenty of fresh water, food, and game. It was across the river from one of the Mandan villages, so trading with the Indians would be easy. The men felled heavy trees to construct the walls of the fort, which they laid out in a great triangle, with rows of huts inside the stockade. They designed the fort to resist attacks, with 18-foot walls, a sentry post, and the keelboat swivel gun mounted as a cannon. From the first days of construction, Indians came to see Fort Mandan. They were intrigued by such a large structure. Curious Indians hung around all day and slept in the explorer's camp at night. The captains worried about security with Indians coming and going so casually. But as the days passed peacefully, the captains relaxed. Before long, all the explorers considered the neighboring Indians their friends. The soldiers began to visit the Mandan in, in, in Hidatsa villages, often spending the night sleeping in the Indian huts. Seamen, like the captains, eyed the Indian visitors suspiciously at first. He snapped at the Indian dogs if they came too close, but as the days passed and the explorers accepted the Indians as friends, Seamen allowed visitors to stroke his fur. He recognized the squaws who offered him chunks of dried meat. He exchanged greeting sniffs with the Indian dogs and he sometimes chased them playfully. 
When he accompanied Shannon or York or Coulter to the Indian villages, Seaman loved to play with the children. He crouched close to the ground and wagged just the tip of his tail, so the children would not be afraid to approach him. Trappers, as well as Indians, came to Fort Mandan to visit. The captain spent long hours chatting with the trappers, trying to learn about landmarks farther up the Missouri River. They sketched maps based on the trappers' accounts. The captains asked questions about the Indian tribes who lived out west, but their languages and customs, and about how they felt about whites. Lewis and Clark took notes on everything they heard. One of the trappers was Toussaint Charbonneau, a 46-year-old French-Canadian living with the Hadatsa Indians. He spoke the Hadatsa language as well as French and some English, and he had Indian wives who knew the language of the tribes living further up the river. Charbonneau offered to come along on the expedition as an interpreter. He even offered to take one of his wives to help translate. The captains were interested in Charbonneau's offer, but they wanted to get to know him before deciding to hire him. Charbonneau's wives made their first visit to the camp on December 11th, when the fort was being built. They brought four buffalo robes to the captains. Both wives were teenagers from the Shoshone, a tribe that lived near the Rocky Mountains. The two girls had been captured by the Hadats Indians in a raid, and Charbonneau had purchased both of them. One of Charbonneau's wives was a slender young woman with braids down her back. Her swollen stomach showed she was pregnant. She introduced herself as Sakagawea, a Hadatsa word that means bird woman. After delivering the buffalo robes, Sakagawea watched the men building the fort. Her calm, gentle manner attracted seamen. Sakagawea seemed frightened by the big dog, but George Shannon reassured her by telling seamen to sit and by stroking the dog's head. Sakagawea smiled. Then she held out her hand for the dog to smell. Seaman licked her fingers, then nudged her hand so she would stroke his fur. Sakagawea giggled. She looked at Shannon and made the Indian sign for bear. Shannon laughed and said, I guess Seaman does look like a bear cub, but he's as gentle as a kitten. Sakagawea opened her pack and broke off a piece of dried fish. She held it out to Seaman, who gently took it from her fingers. When the dog did not jump up or bark for more tidbits, Sakagawea knelt and looked into his rich brown eyes. Then she turned to the other Hadatsa teenager and spoke in Shoshone. She said, I think this dog has better manners than many men, and both young women grinned. Temperatures were dropping rapidly. November nights on the northern plains were long and terribly cold, but even the freezing darkness brought new wonders. One night, the guard called the captains to look at the sky. What they saw astonished them. The whole sky had become a vast painting. Streaks of glowing light, brilliant whites, gleaming greens, formed perpendicular columns that seemed to float across a deep black backdrop. The natives have often seen these northern lights, but the explorers were astonished by their splendor. During November, lots of snow fell. The men stamped their feet as they worked to keep warm. Their fingers grew stiff, so they stopped to warm them under their coats. Every few minutes, they brushed snow off their hats before it could melt and run down their necks. But Seaman loved the snow. He romped playfully as it fell. Sometimes he stretched out on the ground, letting white flakes collect on his fur until he looked like a big white boulder. As soon as one of the men whistled, Seaman jumped up, flinging the snow into a little blizzard around himself. Fort Mandan was complete enough by November 21st for the explorers to move in. The men eagerly carried their supplies into the wooden huts, relieved to have a shelter against the bitter winter weather. By the end of November, 13 inches of snow lay on the ground. The rivers froze over, and the explorers and Indians could walk across the ice safely. The men put the finishing touches on the fort in no December. On the 17th of December, the captains recorded a temperature of 45 degrees below zero. None of the explorers had ever experienced such cold weather. Hunters returned with frostbitten toes and noses. Lewis treated the frostbitten skin by soaking it in cold water. Afraid the night guards might get severely frostbitten, the captains ordered the guards to work in 30-minute shifts. After the fort was completed, the men had plenty of other work to occupy their time. They hunted and tanned hides to make clothing and footwear. They built wooden sleds to carry supplies across the frozen ground, and they felled big cottonwood trees to make dugout canoes for the rest of their journey. The work kept their bodies in shape and prevented them from becoming edgy with boredom. But winter at Fort Mandan was not simply hard work. It was a time to trade and visit with the Indians, a time to learn about each other's ways. Hunting parties went out, often spending several days camping in sub-zero weather. Sometimes the explorers and the Indians hunted together, 
Although the white men expected to have the advantage in hunting because of their rifles, they found themselves bested by the skilled Indians with their bows and arrows. Riding bareback, the Indians controlled their speedy horses with their knees. The explorers were amazed that the Indians could aim their arrows accurately and shoot forcefully while racing after stampeding buffalo. As snow blanketed the grazing lands, game animals became scarcer and leaner. Hunting was even more difficult because of the wolves that ravenously attacked the killed game before the hunters could dismount. Coulter refused to take semen along on the winter hunts because he worried about the dog trying to defend their meat and getting ripped to shreds by starving wolves. Seaman didn't mope when the hunting parties left him at the fort because visitors aplenty crowded into the enclosure. In fact, so many Indians camped in the fort that the men complained about them getting underfoot. Seaman padded from building to building, collecting hunks of dried meat from the Indians and warm tidbits from the cooks. He settled down inside the doorways and perked up his ears as he watched people come and go. The Indian visitors came to Fort Mandan to trade, visit, and observe the lifestyle of the white men. As the explorers worked, the Indians learned about thermometers that read the temperature. When the Indians peered through an object called the spyglass, they were surprised to see the tiny pine cones on distant trees. The Indians watched curiously as the explorers scribbled on thin sheets of writing paper, the commonplace details of the explorers' everyday lives, as well as their fascinating tools, amazed the fort's visitors. The captain settled down to, to their own work, the task of recording the information gathered so far. Seaman often dozed in the small room where Lewis wrote pages and pages. He listened to Lewis's quail pen scratch out neat lines of cursive. In spite of the dim light, provided mainly by fires and candles, Lewis sat for hours and hours hunched over his writing desk. He described what the explorers had seen and encountered. He recorded where they'd gone and the supplies they used. He wrote about the Indians' customs and his own ideas for trading with the tribe. Sometimes, Seaman brought a stick or pine cone inside Lewis's quarters. He would lie down, his toy resting on his paws, and watch Lewis's hand move across the pages. After a few minutes, Seaman would get up and bring his toy to Lewis. If Lewis ignored him and kept writing, Seaman might nudge Lewis's hand. Lewis would say, no, Seaman, not now, I'm working. But when he looked up and saw Seaman gazing at him with such hopeful eyes, he often changed his mind. All right, Seaman, Lewis grinned. I need to get up and stretch my legs, but I'm only going to play for a few minutes. Get it, Lewis said, tossing the toy for Seaman to retrieve. As the winter months wore on, the expedition's stores of meat ran low. The explorers began to depend on the Indians' dried corn. At first, the Mandans gave away their corn or traded it for trinkets, bits of cloth, metal fish hooks, some face paint. When the Indians realized how much the explorers needed the food, they drove harder bargains. Of course, the expedition could not afford to part with all of the trading goods, since there was a long journey ahead. Finding a reliable winter food supply had become a major problem. The problem was solved when the Indians noticed one of the explorers working at a blacksmith forge. John Shield had set up the forge to repair some of the expedition's tools. The Indians owned metal tools received from earlier traders, and some of these tools had been damaged with use. The Indians began bringing their broken tools to the fort, and Shields charged for his work in corn. Pretty soon, Shields was operating a thriving business, with several men from the crew helping him to stoke the fire and run the forge. Seaman made a wide circle around the forge because he did not like the sound, the loud noise, the pounding metal and the sparks flying from sizzling fires. After several weeks, the explorers had repaired all of the Indians' broken metal objects, but the explorers continued to need Indian corn. So Shields began making new tools, such as axes and scrapers, and sold these to the Indians. The explorers provided other services for their neighbors. The white men had some medicines unknown to the Mandans. The Indians noticed that Captain Lewis was skilled in doctoring frostbite and other ailments. Indian mothers began bringing their children to Lewis for various cures. One child had such severely frostbitten toes that Lewis had to amputate them to prevent the child from dying of an infection. By February, when Sacagawea was ready to give birth, Charbonneau and his family had moved into Fort Mandan. Lewis helped her with the difficult delivery of her son. Charbonneau named their baby Jean-Baptiste. All of the explorers had become fond of gentle, intelligent Sacagawea, and they were proud that her baby was born in their fort. Seaman sometimes sat next to Sacagawea as she nursed Jean-Baptiste. The dog cocked his head to listen to the small, snuffling sounds that the baby made. When Seaman edged close, the infant wrapped his tiny fingers around tufts of the dog's fur. 
So Kagawea smiled and sang a soft lullaby to her son. Seaman licked her face and gently nuzzled the baby. Nighttime inside the fort was filled with firelight, music, dancing, and friendly company. Some of the explorers had brought their fiddles along. One of the fiddlers, a Frenchman named Pierre Cruzat, knew all sorts of tunes. George Shannon had a fine, deep voice, and he loved to sing with Cruzat played. When Shannon sang, Seaman crept close to the young man for a favorite game. Shannon rested his head on Seaman's broad back and crooned as if he were serenading a pretty lady. Seaman waited patiently until Shannon hit a long note, then he licked the singer's cheek. Shannon would pretend to be drenched with slobber. He would frown and chase Seaman around the fire, waving his fists and threatening to spank the dog. Seaman would scoot away, his tail tucked tightly under his hind end. The chase would continue for a while, while the men laughed and whooped, clapping hands and stamping feet. Then Seaman would leap over the heads of the men sprawled on the floor. Finding Coulter or York, Seaman would duck under the fellow's arm and bury his head, rolling himself into a round furry bundle. Night after night, Shannon and Seaman played this game, and it always made the crowd roar with laughter. All the men loved to dance to the fiddle music. They danced into the night, warming muscles grown stiff with the cold. Sometimes they grabbed a partner or danced a reel. On other occasions, they made up their own dance steps and leaped around the floor by themselves. The Indian visitors joined in the dancing and merriment. York was a great favorite at the evening get-togethers. While Cruzette fiddled a lively tune, York danced a jig. He moved so nimbly the Indians were astonished. His feet skipped across the wooden floor as easily as water slips between tree roots. Sometimes York coaxed Seaman to dance with him. York tapped Seaman's chest and the dog raised himself onto his back, legs, and rested his front paws lightly on York's chest. York put his hand on Seaman's sides and swayed to the music. Seaman only put up with this for a minute or two before he wiggled away, leaving York to end with a great belly laugh. As the evening wore on, even the hardiest dancers grew tired, when the men flopped down and the storytelling began. While the men swapped hunting tales, Seaman lay with his front paws crossed, his head held high to watch the speakers. When the men told quieter stories about their families back home, Seaman lowered his head and dozed contentedly as John Coulter stroked his long, thick, thick fur. During the month of February, the weather began to change. On sunny afternoons, a top layer of snow melted. Then at night, it iced over. The men of the Corps of Discovery grew restless to continue their journey. On March 2, 1805, one of the explorers came running into the fort to announce that the ice on the Missouri River had begun to break up. That meant the expedition would soon be able to travel again. Throughout March, the fort bustled with activity. The men finished hollowing out the new dugout canoes and caulked the older boats so they wouldn't leak. They smoked meat for the journey ahead. Elk skin was dried and stretched into ropes. Supplies were gathered and packed tightly into boxes. The smaller group of explorers prepared to return to St. Louis with the keelboat and the scientific information gathered in the first 11 months. They loaded the captain's field notes, letters, and journals. They packed the collections of plants and minerals hides, horns, and skeletons of animals, badger, hare, weasel, mouse and squirrel, red fox, coyote, and lynx, bighorn sheep and antelope were packed to be sent to President Jefferson and the scientists in Philadelphia. The men carried aboard the living, the live specimens, a prairie dog, a grouse hen, and four magpies, and stored them in the Kiowot's cabin. Some Indian clothing was included, along with bows and arrows, a buffalo robe, and seats for Indian tobacco and corn. Preparations for travel continued for through the first week of April. The captains decided to hire Charbonneau as a translator. Although the Frenchman wanted the job, he asked to be excused from some of the explorer's chores, such as pulling heavy boats upriver or standing guard at night. The captains insisted if Charbonneau was going to be hired, he would have to do his share of all the work. Charbonneau hesitated, but he finally agreed to the captain's terms. He offered to bring Sacagawea to help him translate the Indians' languages, and the captains enthusiastically agreed. Sacagawea spoke the language of the Shoshone Indians and knew some of the country they would travel through. She would be a living symbol of the expedition's peaceful intentions toward the Indians. Surely, none of the tribes at Forever would mistake the Corps of Discovery for a war party if an Indian woman and her baby were traveling with the group. Sakagawea carried her family's belongings onto the boats, her infant son strapped on the board against her back. 
The explorer scrambled to help the young mother, and Seaman pranced along the riverbank beside her. When a shirt slipped out of her pack and dropped on the ground, Seaman picked it up and carried it in his mouth to the boats. On April 7th, everything was packed and ready to go. The men said their goodbyes to friends among the Mandans. The captains gave final instructions to the group of men taking the keelboat back to St. Louis and waved farewell to them as they headed downriver. The Corps of Discovery boarded two pierogies and six dugout canoes and pushed off, heading upstream toward the Western Sea. After more than five months at Fort Mandan, the explorers were delighted to be back on the river again. That night in his journal, Lewis described this moment of my departure as among the most happy of my life. Oops.